good? I think we're good. All right, thank you guys for coming. Welcome. Um, if I haven't met you yet, I'm Jonathan Lampell, and I work at CG Cookie as a Blender instructor. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about lighting because it's my favorite subject uh, when it comes to 3D. Um, definitely my favorite. And did anybody go to Gleb's talk earlier this morning? That was fantastic. Uh, but one thing that if you look online for tutorials about lighting um, or composition or anything like that, with those subjects, um, usually it goes in one of two directions. You either get super, super specific, um, you know, this is how to do this exact thing, and it only works in you know, that exact scenario, and you get super cookie cutter results, and it's just not, uh, not that helpful, really. Or you get super abstract, um, and you're left wondering, like, how do I even apply this to everyday production? So my goal in this talk is to help uh, bridge those two a little bit and um, share my workflow of how I go about lighting, and hopefully that's it's practical and, and helps you guys. So the first thing, before we go into lighting, um, a lot of the things that go into like the decision-making process happen before you even open up Blender. So first we're going to cover a few basics um, to how to approach this in the first place so that when we do get into Blender, then, then we can go and start making things right away. So the first thing I want everybody to, to remember is intentionally communicate. So the art that we set, the art that we make says something. So it either tells a story about us or it tells a story about the brand that we are communicating for. Uh, so the models, the textures, the lighting, um, all of it works together to, to say something. And if it's not all you know, pointing in one direction, if your you know, lighting says one thing, your model says something else, uh, it just gets really confusing. So you know, need to make sure that you are intentionally communicating something throughout all of these aspects of, of your scene. So uh, one thing I was thinking about when I was making this presentation is public speaking. I haven't really done a lot of public speaking, so I was worried, like, what if I get up here and I have something I really want to share that I think is super cool, but um, it doesn't come across right, or I just can't find the right words to say it. And that's exactly what happens with, with lighting a lot of times, is the lighting and the layout of our scene is like the presentation skills. So even if you have a super cool model, uh, if you don't present it in a way that's that's clear and understandable upon like first read, then a lot of that work is, is lost. Um, so a quick example is we have this car render here, and all it shows is it's a car. Um, you know it's probably a really nice model, but there's nothing there's nothing really special about it. It's not really saying anything other than, hey, I'm a car, I'm a Lamborghini, and it's, uh, it's, it's red, and that's pretty neat. And that's about it. Um, so that, it gets a little boring, um, especially when you see hundreds of these a day. So it's much better to actually have a story or something that's you know, a little bit more interesting and uh, says something about the work that you're doing and, and about the, the project itself. So the... Um, so everything, when it comes to lighting, everything that you uh, do, all the decisions that you make should be based around what it is that you're trying to communicate. So whether that's the color of the light, the strength of the light, where it's placed, um, the size of the shadows, all of that, if it doesn't serve to articulate what the point is of the render in the first place, then you should probably get rid of it and start over, and that'll save you a lot of time in the long run. So uh, the second thing we need to get to is the idea of framework over formula. So we've all heard of three-point lighting, um, I'm sure, and it's definitely something we've, we've heard a lot about. And it's a really great framework that you know, I use all the time, but it's a really boring formula. And what I mean by that is, is a formula is more of a step-by-step a -step process of you know, checking boxes, okay, I did this one thing, I did this other thing, I guess now I'm done, um, and you end up getting the same result over and over again. And you don't really know why you're doing what you're doing. But a framework is the underlying principles of what makes that important in the first place. So for three-point lighting, we we're you know, familiar with key lights, fill lights, and backlights. And the key light highlights the form of the subject, the fill light softens by you know, lighting the shadows, and the backlight separates the foreground from the background. But when I'm talking about viewing things as a framework instead of a formula, we're not really thinking about you know, having three lights in the scene, and you know, this one is this specific light. Uh, we're thinking more about what those lights are supposed to do. So as long as we're thinking in terms of highlighting, softening, and separating, then we have a much better way to approach things and making sure that instead of having you know, these three lights need to go in these three areas, you're looking at your render as a whole and saying, OK, this is where I need to separate the foreground from the background. This is how I'm going to go about it. Um, so that's definitely helpful. So um, 
a way that, you know, a practical example of this is this office chair. So the model was actually off of BlendSwap by eMirage, but let's pretend this is for a advertisement. And, you know, this is the basic three-point lighting setup. It's, you know, effectively lighting the chair. We can see it, so there are lights. Um, but it's not really saying anything other than that. So this is the three-point formula. You set it up, you're done, uh, that's all. But if you take the three-point framework and instead look at where the highlights are and you know, where the shadows need to be softened and where things need to pop off, you don't really care about how many lights you're using or you know, specifically where they are, but you get a much better result because you're focusing on the things that actually matter. Now, so this is better than the first result, but you'll notice that I didn't apply the first principle. I'm not intentionally communicating anything. And uh, the way you generally, or at least the way I like to do that, is with um, textures and colors. So if you're in a production environment and you have a, a tight deadline, you don't really have time to fiddle around with colors and see you know, what works and what does this one mean when contrasted to that one. You know that would take forever. Um, so one thing that I have is a book called The Complete Color Harmony. And I knew for this project that, you know, if you want to buy a chair, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for, is it, you know, dependable? Can I sit on it and it won't break? And is it comfortable? That's all a chair really has to do, is be comfortable and not break. So I looked for colors that, um, in this book, so this book is uh, just a whole bunch of colors and they're all organized by, um, by different uh, either like cultural significances or meanings or um, color schemes. So every th possible thing you can think of, uh, there's groups of colors for it in this book. So I looked up dependability, and that was like yellows and reds and browns. And I looked up, um, let's see, what was the other one? It was classy, was like lots of blues and, and grays. Um, and I forgot what the other one was, but it had, uh, had to do with yellows and such. So. I just took those. I didn't even think about it. I just looked it up in the book and plugged those straight in, and I got a much better result. So I also added like a little barn doors texture. But um, so you're getting a much better result because you're taking the the colors of things that actually mean something and plugging them in um, instead of just going with the same black and white. So uh, if you can help it, default to using colors. Don't use white lights unless you know that's something that you're specifically trying to communicate. Um, just stay away from it and uh, try not to use black shadows, um, and that'll help you go a lot longer, a lot um, farther in the process. So another example of, of, of a framework instead of a formula. So we've all heard of three-point lighting, but one thing that I've found super helpful is this framework for adding depth to a scene. So I don't know if you've ever worked with a client and they just say like, hey, I want this to pop out more. What do you do? You're just like, okay, um, I'll, I'll do something. So let's take a look at how we can add depth to a scene fairly easily, and, and this is something that you can apply today. So this is a cube on the screen, but it doesn't really look like a cube because it's completely flat. Um, there's no lighting information, and so we can therefore say that by adding light to the scene, that's what adds depth. Um, and more specifically, the change of light from one face to another is what creates the illusion of depth, because it's not an actual 3D object that's poking out of the screen, it's just the illusion of depth. So we can say that the change of light creates the illusion of depth. And so once we have that, we can turn that up a notch. Instead, and uh, instead of saying the change of light from one face to another, you can say the change of light across the face is what creates depth as well as from one face to another. So by adding gradients to um, the surfaces of your objects, that's going to give you even more depth. But of course, there's more things that we can change across the face, and that is also color. So this is what traditional artists call a hue shift or a color shift, um, and that's just making sure that you're changing the hue of the color along the face as well as as well as the value. So I don't know if that shows up well on the projector screen or not, um, but if you compare that to you know the one above it to the left, it's definitely a you know much better result, and it's it's popping out, and you're giving definition. So of course you want those colors to at least communicate something. So uh, I was looking for an example of, of a render and uh, Chris Kuhn let me borrow one of his, his scenes. So he modeled this and put it on CG Cookie and I thought it was a lot of really cool modeling with the robots and stuff, but the lighting is very flat. And so I asked him if I could borrow the scene and, and just tweak it briefly and he agreed. So just by you know applying those, those frameworks, um, 
very quick, quickly we're able to get a much different result and when we're focusing on gradients over the sur surfaces of the objects that we're trying to attract attention to um, and communicating something, in this case, you know, focus and, and work and uh, that type of theme, then we're definitely getting a better result. So you can also definitely take a look, um, focus on the face as I like flip between these two. So they're definitely communicating two completely different things. Uh, the first one is kind of like, I hate my life, what am I doing? Um, <laughs> but the second one, more accurately portrays the you know concentration. I'm trying to you know do something. Don't bother me. Um, so I think that works a little bit better. And so by making sure that your lighting is communicating the same thing as the modeling and the layout, then you can get a much better result. So let's um, jump into Blender and show how this works. All right, so I have this chair example that I used earlier. There we go. Uh, this laptop isn't super powerful, so it might take some time. But over here on the, the left side of the screen, I generally just have a render preview so I can be looking through things all at once. Um, I have some nodes over on the bottom. And just uh, since I'm using a laptop and don't have a number pad, I switched to quad view so I can easily um, rotate all of these lights at once. So a couple things that we can do to make this better for lighting quickly. Uh, one thing that I do is go to the layers panel and under material, you can add a material override for all of the materials in your scene. And this is super helpful because I can just take a clay material and apply it there. And then in the viewport render, if I go over to this right side and click render layer, then I'm just seeing this as uh, just the, the clay material, and so I can more accurately see the gradients across the surface of the object, and I can more accurately see the colors that are being applied. And if I need to switch between the two, you can just toggle this, and uh, it's a much faster workflow. The second thing is uh, over here on this right side, if you have a really complex scene, um, it can be very difficult to, to like hide lights and find them again. Uh, so I just switch this from visible layers to same types, and that way if I just select one light, I can see all of the other you know, lights in the scene right here, and I don't have to worry about all of the other mess of, of objects. So I'm going to delete all of these lights, and we can start over. So right now, we're just seeing the chair lit by the environment, but the thing that we need to do is, well, I guess I'll show this first. So if we add a light, uh, let's go to lamp, and um, I like to use area lights. So let's take that, and you, we can start positioning this and, and playing with it. Um, but you'll notice as we, as we place, this, place this, we can't see things as clearly as we should be able to. So um, I turn off everything except the light that we're working on. So in this case, the background needs to be gone. And that way, with just the one light, we can see very clearly exactly what it's doing. Um, because if it's muddled up by a bunch of other lights, then you know, it, it's very difficult to actually figure out what it is that it's doing. So, you know, if we just place this um, somewhere where it's getting the most amount of gradient across this top over here, we can see if we place it too close, then it's starting to look flat again. So we just want to make sure that we have a lot of gradient over those little bumps over there. Um, and this is going to be our main light. So if you were doing the three point uh, three-point formula, you'd say, okay, this is my key light, now I have to fill, fill in with a fill light. But since we're not really thinking about that, we're thinking about gradients across the surface of the object, and we're thinking about highlighting the things that we need to highlight, we're definitely not done, because you can see this part of the chair over here is completely flat um, from left to right, and also this bottom part of the chair uh, also just doesn't have any gradients across it, so it's going to look flat and uninteresting. So we can just take this light and duplicate it down, and place it very specifically so that it lights exactly that uh, backrest lumbar support thing. So it's definitely adding too much of a shadow, so let's take this and increase the size to something where it's not being an issue, and probably turn the strength down a little bit. So once we have that, then we now have a gradient over there, and we can do the same thing for this bottom part right here. So now we have our fill lights because now we can see that it's accurately um, doing what fill, our uh, key lights are supposed to do. So we're creating the gradients and we are making sure that the chair is highlighted. 
So now we can fill in the lights and I'll duplicate this over. And for this one, we can see that the things that need to be filled is uh, this right side of the chair. But instead of trying to fill it like it is, um, because we're not seeing exactly what the light's doing, if, it's, if we're looking at all of these other things as well, we can't really see it clearly. So let's go ahead and turn all of these off. But uh, we have the render layer on, so we need to turn off the cameras instead. And now we can just look at one thing at a time. So again, we're continuing to look at gradients, and in this case, from the top to the bottom. And then we also need to fill in this area down here on the bottom, so let's duplicate that again. And this is somewhat of a tedious process, but it doesn't really take any you know, extra brain power. I'm just doing the same things over and over again. However, you, know, you need to be consciously aware of, of this, um, but it's certainly much better than, than just adding you know, whatever formula you have. So let's take that, and we can, we can call that good, and make our backlights. So and then we can move on to a different example. But then let's take this and duplicate it one more time, turn off the other ones, so that we're just looking, oh, there we go. So we're just looking at that one. And so we're just doing the exact same thing for this light, but we're focusing on you know, how it's popping it off of the background and making sure that we have the gradient from the top to the bottom. We can also do that for this armrest over here. And if you need to focus something um, so that you can see that you know, maybe we don't want it over here on, on this side of the chair, um, since we already have the key light there. Then we can just change this to a uh, spot lamp and direct it there and not worry about any of the other parts of the scene. All right, this is definitely really small to work with, but that's okay. All right, so we have all of our lights, and if we look at them all at once, like so, uh, we are definitely getting a much better result than the three-point lighting that was on that layer. So you can see there's a, a pretty big difference between the two. Um, again, it's just the idea of making sure that you're going back to the original intent of you know, what is this light trying to accomplish and making sure that every single light has a purpose for that. So I hope, um, I don't know, that was somewhat of a, of a boring example because you're just doing the same thing over and over again, but that, that is lighting and you're just making sure that each light has its own job. So uh, with that, I think I have, yeah, I have one more example. Yes, okay. So here's a room and this is a, a different technique that is good to use and that is exaggeration. So a lot of the time, if you're working with in, like interior architecture, does anybody here do interior design or architectural visualization much? Okay, a few people, so hopefully, hopefully this is helpful. So a lot of the time you'll notice that in cycles, it takes a really long time for the noise to clear, right? That's probably one of the, the largest issues. So I took a technique out of like super old school um, Pixar and the way that they light things is, you know, they don't rely on the bounces. Um, that's something Gleb mentioned earlier, is you don't want to rely on cycles to do all of the work and hope that it's realistic. So. Uh, what we're going to do is instead set up simple lighting for this room um, and make sure that it looks looks good without too many bounces. So let's go to rendered view. Okay, so the first thing when you're setting up lighting like this is we can go ahead and in the render and light paths, turn everything to zero. So it's pretty much just like Blender internal. And now what we're, what we're going to do is you know, fake all of the bounce lighting that Cycles had for us. So if we take that, we can say that, okay, so we're going to have this spot on the ground that's going to be bouncing light back on to the rest of the room. So we can add another light. And we 
can increase the size so it's about the same size as the spot on the floor. I see that would make it easier to see. And then rotate it so that it's bouncing up into the room. Move it down. So we're just sort of approximating uh, what the bounce is and then exaggerating it a little bit. So of course it's going to lose some of that light as it scatters around. Uh, but now we're getting a little bit more light in the room um, from that same effect. And another thing that we can do to sort of fake the light that's coming in through the window because, you know, that's, if it's not bouncing around, um, then we're not getting that sort of soft glow that you usually get in interiors. So we can duplicate that light and put it over the window and instead just sort of fake the, the atmosphere as it comes in. So since we can't really see very clearly what this light is doing, again, we need to hide the other ones. So we're just looking at one at a time. And so when we place this over the window and increase the strength, we now have somewhat of the effect of, of the atmosphere coming in. So with just these three examples, um, you know, you can definitely go crazy with this. I've seen some setups where it's like they have a light on like every wall and even uh, the last time they used to fake global illumination. So that's, they would put a light for every color that was bouncing off and it gets crazy. So you could do that, um, but we're not going to. We're just going to take this and add some color to it. So say the sun is a little bit yellow, but the atmosphere is not yellow, so we can make that a little bit bluish. Actually, no, that'll be a more of a tan, and then maybe as it bounces off, then we start getting a different color. So as long as they're not all the same color and they're sort of uh, working together, actually, you know, it would probably look pretty cool to make this more of like a sunset-ish atmosphere. Okay, so we have that, and now that we have this looking, you know, somewhat okay with just these, this is uh, one bounce, then we can go ahead and turn this back up. And then when you do that, you don't really have to render quite as much and your scene is going to clear up way faster than if you just, uh, you know, cranked up the bounces and turned on the one light and added an HDRI. Um, this is going to save you quite some time. So that went pretty fast, but that's what I have. Um, is, there, is there any questions? I hope that was helpful. Did you learn something from that? Okay, cool. Mostly just because it breaks the habit of doing that, um, and it's just something a lot of painters do, and so they they make sure that they get the colors of the surrounding objects in there. Um, right. So I guess in in this case, yeah, that's a good point. Um, in this case, when it comes to three D, like you can't really, I mean, you can control the the color of your shadow through the. I forgot what it's called, but in like the world settings. Um, but generally, I just change it a little bit with uh, color grading at the end. Um, but yeah, as long as it's, you can't have it black, but it just uh, kind of kills the, the overall feel that you're going for temp generally. I've seen uh, movies where I could recognize the CG parts because the CG artists refuse to make their shadows black. Really? Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> okay, so VFX. Yeah, uh, I'm a photographer as well, so I uh -huh. like to have these deep blacks in my photos. Ooh, okay. It's an artistic choice, of course. Uh huh. But yeah, if you, uh, okay, makes sense. Point taken. All right. <laughs> Mm 
Right. So. Okay. So sort of like uh, you would take, you know, an, an HDR photo and then increase it later. Very cool. Uh, world, I I do use um, I like to use HDRs um, quite often, uh, but the the reason I didn't really talk about that here is because a lot of people like they just put in an HDR and then it's it's done. Um, but if you if you take that and use that as you know some some fill or like reflection sources, or um, as long as you're making sure that you're you're rotating in a way where you're getting the most amount of gradient across the surface of the object, um, then it's good. But other than that, I, I don't really mess with that too much as long as it uh, complements the, the lighting. Oh, no, I, I don't generally change that. But that would be one way to um, get, the, get the shadows to be a different color. But usually I fill it in. Um, so instead of changing the actual shadows, uh, fill it in with a, a light source of a different color. Um, that's just a little bit more subtle. So it's not, there's still a little bit of light in there. Does that answer the question? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I like to have the background at least at least when I'm starting out being completely black because that way we can see the the color of the light more accurately. Um, no, I, I definitely use it for interiors, um, architecture, and, and things like that. Um, but if you do this technique of you know creating the bounce light yourself and sort of exaggerating it a little bit, then uh, usually then I don't because that has the same effect, but it's a little bit more tweakable and more more customizable. Cool. Are we good? All right. Thanks. Thank you.